In this video, I wanna summarize and recap some of the things we've learned in the past few uh, lectures, and then explain a little bit more why these kind of concepts are important and how we can see them in the real world. So let's start with our little model uh, structure here, uh, just a simple member. And remember, I can put this thing in uh, compression, tension, bending, whatever I want. And what we've been talking about is what happens when I have a load on this member. So here I'm putting it in compression. And now if we imagine that I come in and I remove a chunk of it, a little square here, and I put the exact same load back on the structure uh, as I was before I removed this little section, what we're really asking are what are the forces that are acting along this surface and how are they distributed? So distributed forces, right, are stresses. So what are the normal forces and the shear forces acting on these different surfaces when I remove this object such that uh, everything else in the, in the problem would remain the same, right? So when I load this thing by removing it, now the load path is a little bit different around this hole if there were truly a hole there. So our hole, again, is really an imaginary hole. And I can remove a section like this. I could remove a different section at a different angle. And I, again, I could ask the same question. And that's really all we're doing is we're saying, what are the forces that are acting on these internal structures when I remove little elements at different angles um, such that the total forces within the member remain the same, whether that thing is in there or not. So let's quickly revisit and redo two of our classic cases. So over here, I have a member in compression. I extract a little element out and I draw its free body diagram, which in this case just has a uniform compressive stress of magnitude P over A, uh, where A is just the cross-sectional area of this column. And I've written it as negative using our sign convention that compression is negative. So the center of the circle is given by the average of the normal stress of these two faces. So here it's just gonna be sigma over two, but in the negative direction. So let's just call that sigma over two. Here. Now I need to plot the state of stress on these two faces. So here I have a normal stress of minus sigma and no shear stress. So right there on our axis, here I have zero stress overall. So there's our three points. And now all we have to do is draw a circle. So there's our circle. Uh, an important point is the point of maximum uh, shear, which you can see just by a tangent line is also sigma over two. So how do we interpret this result? Well, if we want to know what the state of stress is of an element which is tilted at 45 degrees, right? Because remember this angle here is two times 45 degrees. So what happens when we extract an element at 45 degrees instead of uh, the one we did here? This would describe the state of stress. So here's our element tilted at 45 degrees to represent the point right here. And our state of stress, we see we have a negative compressive stress of sigma over two. We have a positive shear stress wanting to rotate the element counterclockwise, also of magnitude sigma over two. The state of stress on this face, which would be what we would get if we rotated another 90 degrees or 180 degrees on the circle, is just the opposite side. So the exact same state, and we also have the same magnitude of shear stress, but it's of opposite sign as it always should be. So going in that direction. And again, all that means is we know the state of stress in this configuration, we draw the circle, we rotate the element, and that would tell us what the state of stress it is, would be for an element I pulled out at 45 degrees. Now let's do the same thing, but for our, our uh, bar over here in pure torsion. So here I have a bar in pure torsion. Our state of stress when I extract an element as such is just pure shear. Here, finding the center of the circle is quite easy because there are no normal stresses, so the average of the normal stresses is just zero. Our state on this face is zero, right? Zero compressive stress or tensile stress, so along this axis here, uh, where sigma is zero, and we have the value of the shear stress, which I'll just say is this value here. This side is equal and opposite in terms of the magnitude of the shear stress. And here, what this value is of the shear stress is just related to the total applied torque. And we have to go back and look at our formulas 
for a circular bar in torsion. But now I've got the center and two points on my circle, so it's easy to draw. So there's our circle with our interesting point located here, which means that if I rotate our element 45 degrees in this direction, I would have a maximum tensile stress whose magnitude would also be the same as the shear stress tau. So here is our element rotated at 45 degrees, so representing the state of stress right here on Moore's circle tells us that we have a tensile stress whose magnitude is tau, no shear stresses, and it means if we want to know the forces on this face or the state of stress, we just pop to the other side of the circle and that tells us we have a compressive stress, also a value tau. And there it is. So two classic cases of uh, using Moore's circle to understand the state of stress of an arbitrary element that we've extracted from beams uh, under different loadings. And again, all these forces and stresses represent are what would have to be the forces acting on a hole of this kind of shape right here to keep the rest of the forces internal to the beam the same. Okay, so now let's look at some real world consequences of these two pictures here. Look at our column and compression. So just to summarize, more circle tells us that when we have a column in compression, that the maximum shear stress is oriented along a plane at 45 degrees. So if we have a material whose strength is weaker in shear than in compression, we would expect to see, or we expect we might see cracking along that 45 degree angle. So if I were pushing on this and this material were relatively weak in shear, what we'd see is that if we exceeded the critical load that the thing cracks and it cracks at a 45 degree angle. And if you look carefully, as you walk around the world, you'll see lots of 45 degree cracks, especially in stone, concrete, and brick structures because concrete and materials like that tend to be weaker in shear than they are in pure compression. So here's a few images taken uh, just from looking on the internet. Uh, here's a few, here's some brick structures where we see that kind of typical 45 degree crack. This one's quite large, uh, so is this one. But if you look at many, many uh, brick structures and you look up in the, especially in the corners, you'll see a lot of cracks that look like this and a lot of uh, defects where you see these kind of 45 degree cracks, which is related to the effect that we've just been talking about. Uh, if you look around uh, the edge of houses uh, when they have the foundation up, you'll often see the same thing in foundation. So a lot of cracks at this kind of diagonal 45 degree angle. Uh, if you have a home with plaster drywall like mine, uh, you'll find maybe not quite as bad as this one, but a lot of 45 degree cracks uh, in the ceiling. And again, all these effects related to the, the maximum shear stress in compression being oriented at that 45 degree plane. Uh, here is a test uh, where they're looking at a concrete beam in compression. So it's being held here and loaded here. And again, you see that kind of nice 45 degree crack right there. So again, uh, same effect. Here's some images after uh, earthquakes. And again, we see a lot of 45 degree cracking here because as the structure shakes, they tend to be weaker in shear. So here's a 45 degree angle this way and this way. Uh, this column here, we see again, kind of the same X pattern, that same kind of 45 degree angle here, and a lot of diagonal cracking uh, in the tile uh, here as well. So again, this is where we see these kind of effects in the real world. And if you look around again, as you walk around, especially looking at brick buildings, uh, you'll often see evidence of these uh, 45 degree cracks uh, all around you. So now let's turn to the bar and torsion. So our bar and torsion, if we just uh, review what we just saw, is that if we look at elements which are inclined at 45 degrees, uh, that the element is only subject to either tension or compression, depending on which way I twist the bar and which way I'm looking. So here's our rubber model with our grid lines. And here in the middle, I have a square that's drawn at that 45 degrees. And when I twist it, we see that it maintains its rectangular shape, but it el elongates in one direction and compresses in the other. And again, when I twist it this way, 
uh, the effect is the same, it's just kind of reversed. And so this could have an impact on failure of materials if we have materials which are weaker under either tension and compre or compression uh, than shear. And now this effect can be seen pretty easily with a piece of chalk. So here I had a large piece of sidewalk chalk and I twisted it and look how it cracked. Look at that, that exact 45 degree spiral. So just to recap for a few examples of our canonical examples of pure compression and pure torsion, understanding more circle and the state of stress for surfaces which are inclined at different angles. Uh, this is a very important concept in the mechanics of materials and it's a concept that we're going to generalize even further, introducing something called a tensor, which describes the complexity of stress in an object. But we'll hold off on that for just a little bit, but that will be coming soon.